So today we're going to be talking about Daniel Kahneman, both some of my personal connections to him and his work, but more generally about his work and psychology of decision making, which is very much uh, the area of my doctoral work. <clears throat> okay, so welcome to everybody. Thank you for showing up. Uh, I did a X Spaces yesterday, impromptu one. It was titled uh, Things That Are Pissing Me Off. Uh, and people said, please have this as a regular series. I just kind of riffed off the top of my head on things that are getting me angry. Uh, I talked about uh, four different things. Uh, it should be pretty easy to find on my feed. Uh, and today I decided to do this one because as I started saying a minute or two ago, uh, as I was going through the my Twitter feed, I noticed uh, Shai Davidai, actually the uh, Columbia University professor in the business school who I recently had on my show, who's been having all sorts of problems with anti-Semitism at Columbia. I first read it on his uh, Twitter feed that uh, Daniel Kahneman had passed away. So what I thought I would do is uh, just, as I said, talk about truly what a gigantic uh, psychologist Daniel Kahneman is. It's, it's really, a, if you don't know anything about him, that, that's okay. But, you but even if you're not a, an academic or if you're not a, you know, a psychologist, uh, it's worth knowing his work. Uh, some of you may have gotten to know his work in his 2011 book, Thinking Fast and Slow, which refers to uh, System 1 and System 2 processing you know, fast processing, autonomic processing uh, versus more deliberative, cognitively effortful processing. So, and in that book, he kind of went over many of the, the, the research streams that he had developed, largely with Amos Tversky, who was his call. They're both uh, Israeli originally, both Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman. Regrettably, Daniel Kahneman, I'm not sorry, not Daniel Kahneman, uh, Amos Tversky passed away in 1996 of a aggressive melanoma, which I think had spread to his kidney. Uh, and so, uh, you know, he didn't, he wasn't around to see when uh, Daniel Kahneman won the 2002 uh, Nobel Prize in economics. But in any case, what I wanted to do first, and then I'll get into, I'll drill down into what the research of Daniel Kahneman is and how it uh, it shaped my own thinking and psychology of decision making and so on. I want to read you a passage, uh, a section in uh, my latest book, The Sad Truth About Happiness. This is the chapter where I'm talking about all sorts of correlates to happiness. How does personality affect happiness? How does political orientation affect happiness? How does uh, you know, religiosity affect happiness, how does culture affect happiness, so on. And so at one point, I'm talking about the link between uh, money and happiness. And uh, actually, it's something that recently I posed uh, for those of you who listened to our uh, my chat with uh, Elon Musk. I, I actually, I mean, obviously, I'm talking to the richest uh, man in the world. It seemed uh, uniquely apropos to ask him what did he think about whether uh, money... Uh, leads to happiness. The, the research, the, the classic study on that issue had found that once your basic needs are met, at the time I think it was $75,000, but this needs to probably be updated a bit given inflation. But once your needs are met, you don't have to worry about you know putting a roof over your head, having food for your kids. Uh, the, the utility that you reap from having an extra million or whatever that doesn't really add much to happiness. But anyways, so in, in this section where I'm talking about does money lead to happiness, I'm talking about a personal story uh, regarding a Nobel Prize winner versus, you know, money. So let me just read it for you because the name David Con uh, Daniel Kahneman comes up. And so I'm just going to read to you. It's, it's about a page long, a, a bit more than a page. It's on pages 20 and 21 of, as I said, my happiness book. So the title of the section is A Nobel Prize or Money. So I'll first read you that section, maybe comment a bit more about that issue, and then I'll drill into 
the Daniel Kahneman stuff. So here we go. In my academic career, I have had the honor of meeting and interacting with several Nobel Prize winners or eventual winners. My first such experience was as a first-year doctoral student at Cornell University when I took Richard Thaler's Behavioral Decision Theory course. Thaler went on to win the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences in 2017. In 1992, as a young doctoral student, if memory serves me right, I met Professor Daniel Kahneman and or perhaps his longtime collaborator Amos Tversky, one of the great thinkers on the topic of decision making. In 2002, as a visiting professor at the University of California at Irvine, I predicted to my MBA class that Kahneman would win the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences. Less than 24 hours later, I learned that he had. I also had brief communications with the other 2002 Nobel laureate in economics, Vernon L. Smith, as well as with Paul Greengard, a 2000 Nobel Prize winner in physiology or medicine, and with Kip Thorne, winner of the Nobel Prize in physics in 2017. While each of these encounters was memorable, none was quite as awe-inspiring as when Herb Simon, winner of the Nobel Mem Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences in 1978, visited Cornell University in 1993. My doctoral supervisor, supervisor knew him well and hence had met him for lunch. I was miffed at the time that I had not been invited to join them, but my disappointment was attenuated when my supervisor sent me a memo which I still have somewhere, telling me how Simon had praised some of my work. I share these brushes with Nobel Prize winners to contrast how I define wealth, the richness of one's life experience, with how my more materialistically inclined family me members define wealth. During a trip to Rio de Janeiro, I had shared my excitement at meeting the great Herb Simon, one of the truly great polymaths of the 20th century. Rather than sharing in my excitement, my relative smugly stated, quote, Who the hell is this guy? I can probably buy him 500 times over, close quote. To which I retorted, quote, Perhaps, but while 500 people will wait in line to hear him speak, no one cares what you have to say, close quote. So there you have it. Two ways to accumulate wealth, through amassing brilliant moments or amassing piles of dollars. Both have their points, but the former can enrich your soul. The latter, if it is all you value, can rot it. And so the reason I mentioned that story is, is was because, you know, uh, here was a family member who was so materialistically inclined that he wasn't impressed with the fact that Herb Simon was this great thinker, one of the great polymaths of the 20th century. By the way, Herb Simon won the Nobel Prize in 1978 for his work on bounded rationality. So now I'm going to get into the technical weeds. Okay, so bear with me. This will give you a good sense of uh, what you could expect if you were taking a, a course with me at, at university. So Herb Simon won it because he argued that uh, human beings as decision makers are boundedly rational. So the concept of bounded rationality means that Contrary to what classical economists think, which is that if we are going to maximize utility and, and arrive at an optimal choice, we should you know, process all of the relevant uh, and available information prior to making a choice, whether we're choosing between political candidates to vote for or choosing between cars to purchase or houses to buy. We're going to look at all of the available information and go through a very deeply cognitively effortful process because that's the only way that we can make sure that we're going to maximize our utility. And what uh, Herb Simon said is, well, no, we're bounded by the fact that it is cognitively costly to, to, you know, to acquire information. Uh, there, is, there are search costs, there is tedium. So for all sorts, there's time pressures. So we are, yes, we are rational, in that you know we apply certain decision rules in arriving at hopefully the best possible you know option, but we are bounded by all these different things. So that was one of the things that he talked about. I'm, I'm somewhat simplifying, but that's the general idea. Now, to my point about classical economics, so in classical economics, you have what's called Homo economicus. Homo economicus is the idea 
that human beings, to the extent that they are rational, they are rational in terms of abiding to certain axioms of rational choice. Now, what does that mean? That sounds like a mouthful. So let me give you example. This is, by the way, this is called normative decision making, because normative decision making is the idea that if we're to presume that consumers, for example, are rational beings, they ought to adhere to certain norms of rationality. Hence, that's what we mean by normative decision making. So what is an example of an axiom of rational choice? And then I will come to the outlandishly brilliant work of Kahneman and Tversky. So take, for example, the transitivity axiom. The transitivity axiom from mathematics, in this case as applied to choice theory, says that if I prefer car A to car B, and I prefer car B to car C, it has to be that I prefer car A to car C, right? So if A is greater than B and B is greater than C, then it has to be that A is greater than C. So if you violate that trans transitivity axiom, then you are being irrational in a homo economicus sense. So economists would say that no rational decision maker could ever do that. Well, guess what? In a paper, I think it was in the late 60s, Amos Tversky, the eventual collaborator of Daniel Kahneman, showed that no, that people do make intransitive choices. And he demonstrated it with a very you know, clever set of experiments. Okay. By the way, my doctoral supervisor, who obtained his PhD in cognitive and mathematical psychology at University of Michigan, which is one of the top psychology departments in the world, that's where Amos Tversky also did his PhD, and Daniel Kahneman had gone there, I think, I can't remember if it was for a postdoc or for some reason. Well, the first paper that my doctoral supervisor, Jay Russo, ever published is with Amos Tversky. Again, Amos Tversky being the longtime collaborator of Daniel Kahneman, who won the Nobel Prize. So there is that link. And as I mentioned in the passage that I just read to you, Richard Thaler, who was my professor at Cornell, ended up also winning the Nobel Prize uh, in 2017 for his work in, in behavioral finance and, be, and behavioral economics. Okay, so I just described one uh, axioms of, uh, axiom of rational choice, which is transitivity. Let me describe another one. This is called the axiom of description invariance. Again, it's a mouthful, but you'll, you'll understand it once I give you specific examples. If I tell you that a hamburger is 90% fat-free, or I tell you that a hamburger is 10% fat, those two statements, I so the fancy term is they are isomorphically equivalent. Isomorphically equivalent means they are literally the exact same statement, just framed differently. So it's not you're optimistic or pessimistic or you're a half-full cup or a half empty cup, saying that a burger is 90% fat free is identical to saying that a burger is 10% fat. Okay, now remember that for a second. Or if I tell you that three out of five dentists recommend this toothpaste, it is isomorphically equivalent to telling you that two out of five dentists did not recommend it, right? Again, these are identical statements just framed differently. Now, from a rational choice perspective, from a homo economicus perspective, it has to be that a consumer, it doesn't matter whether I make him try the burger that's 90% fat-free described or 10% fat described, you should arrive at the same final evaluation because it's the exact same burger described in, in, in two equivalent ways. And yet, what Kahneman and Tversky showed and this, is, this became known as the framing effect, that the way that you frame something, even though the two frames are identical logically, can cause people to have preference reversals. Meaning that if you frame it in one way, I choose A over B, but if you frame it the other way, I choose B over A, and hence I'm being axiomatically irrational. Okay, And I'll come back to the framing effect in a second when I talk about a study that I did where I looked at some evolutionary explanations for the framing effect. So bear with me. Let me describe a third uh, 
axiom of rational choice. This is called procedural invariance. So let's suppose I'm going to ask you to choose between two options, A or B. Okay. Now I'm either going to ask you to choose between A or B and I present to you the two choices sequentially or simultaneously. So let me explain what I mean by that. Let's suppose it's two cars and I say, let's say your name is John. Hey John, here's car A and car B. I'm showing you both of them. Tell me which one you prefer. And you say, okay, let me look at both cars. I prefer car A. So that's called a simultaneous presentation. I'm, I'm simultaneously presenting you with both choices, A and B. Now, if I were to show you car A and ask you on a scale of 0 to 100, 0 is the worst possible, 100 is the best possible, please give me a score of what you think of A. So I, sh I show you A and you give it a score of 80. And then I show you B independently, right? It wasn't simultaneous. It was sequential. And now B gets a 90. Well, now you've engaged in irrational behavior. How could it be that when I showed you both cars together, you chose A, but when I showed you first car A and then separately car B, you chose B. Therefore, you're engaging in irrational choice. Well, what Kahneman and Tversky did is demonstrate that all of these axioms of rational choice that classical economists thought is exactly how we ought to behave normatively is complete nonsense. We don't do that. We are not rational in the homo economicus sense of the term. Now, I'll just, I, I won't go into all of their, uh, you know, their incredible research, but I'll just mention one because it was specifically cited when uh, Kahneman won the Nobel Prize. Prospect theory is a, I, I won't go into all the technical details, but the thing that you, you need to remember is if I tell you, for example, that you could lose, you know, you could take a bet that causes you to lose a hundred dollars, or you could take a bet that causes you to win a hundred dollars. The, the pain or pleasure of losing a hundred dollars or winning a hundred dollars is not linear. In other words, your behavior in trying to avoid a loss is much greater than your behavior in trying to, you know, get an equivalent win. And therefore, that became known as loss aversion. And the utility function that captures that loss aversion is part of prospect theory. So it's actually incredibly powerful research because, so think about, the framing effect, which I mentioned a few minutes ago, the one where, you know, 90% fat-free burger versus 10% fat. Now you might say, okay, well, fine, people behave irrationally, but who cares? They're just, you know, they might make an irrational choice when they're choosing between bur you know, burgers. Okay, fine. That's true. That's great. But who, you know, it's not a big deal. No, it is a big deal. Because let's suppose, God forbid, that you go see your surgeon, your oncologist, and the oncologist has to choose between you having radiation therapy or a radical surgery. It's one or the other. Now imagine if I were to tell you that if I frame the odds of success in one way, the surgeon will say, oh, we've got to do radiation therapy. But if I frame it in exactly the equivalent, the logically equivalent other way, I can get him to change his opinion so that he said to you, when, when I framed it in one way, he said we should do radiation therapy. And when I framed it the other equivalent way, he says, oh, no, no, we should do surgery. Well, that's a problem because that's showing you that even within the context of expert domains, the surgeon's mind is, has the exact same architecture as the mind of the rest of us. And he is just as prone sorry, I should say he or she or they, are just as prone to, uh, to commit that, uh, that bias. Another way to think about the work of Kahneman and Tversky is the following. So many of you have probably seen, say, in an intro to psychology course, uh, when you're studying perception, how your perceptual system can be tricked for example, some of you might have heard, I think it's called Ponzo's illusion. If I show you two horizontal lines that are, you know, exactly the same length, but there is, 
they are surrounded by lines that are you know falling from left to right and right to left meaning that the context around the two equidistant the, the, the equal lines can cause you to think that line b is longer than line a even though the two lines are exactly same length i don't know if i've explained this well i wish i could show it to you visually and hopefully one day soon we'll have the whole uh, visual means to do so on x spaces but in the same way that our visual system can succumb to perceptual illusions our mind can succumb to cognitive distortions and so what Kahneman and Tversky did is they systematically through many many decades of research showed that completely contrary to the economic homo economicus model we often succumb to these biases and they went through a whole bunch there's something called the conjunction fallacy the base rate fallacy there's the overconfident there's a million of these okay there's the uh, uh, availability heuristic uh, there's actually you can go on google and just enter cognitive biases and i, I think that's probably the right search term and it will list you all of the cognitive biases that have been documented not, not just by Kahneman Tversky, but by that whole tradition of research. And so I very much was trained uh, within that. So that's why, you know, uh, my original work was in psychology of decision making. As a matter of fact, my doctoral dissertation was in so trying to address one specific problem, uh, which is when is it that a decision maker has acquired enough information to stop acquiring additional information and commit to a choice. So let's say I'm choosing between cars A and B. I could look up to 50 attributes on the two cars, but I won't do that. After maybe seven pieces of information that I've collected, I now have sufficiently differentiated the two alternatives that I think I don't need to look at anymore. I'll stop and I'm ready to buy the, the Toyota. And so I looked at the cognitive stopping strategies that are used in information search and that that's very much part of this whole discussion because classical economists would say no 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 if there are 50 attributes that are relevant for this decision you have to look at all of the relevant and available information otherwise you might be making a suboptimal uh, choice that doesn't maximize your utility so i was very much trained both because of my doctoral supervisor jay russo because of my professor uh, Richard Thaler, who, as I said, eventually ended up winning the Nobel Prize for, for being associated with Kahneman and Tversky. I regret that I never had the opportunity to publish any papers with, uh, with uh, Kahneman and Tversky. I, I do remember my first semester at Cornell uh, in my PhD, I had taken a course by Professor Thaler and I had gone to his office and he had pitched some ideas for us to work on together. And to this day, I regret that we never ended up uh, doing some of the work that we had discussed. It would have been uh, great to, to work with him, a truly uh, you know, brilliant man. Uh, there was also at Cornell other very uh, accomplished uh, decision theorists. For example, Thomas Gilovich was also one of my professors in psychology. Who he So you may have heard of him. In case, if you've read my latest book, my happiness book, I have a chapter on regret. And what uh, Gilevich did is he, he pioneered some of the, the work on the psychology of regret, specifically the idea that there are two sources of uh, regret that we face. It could be either due, uh, regret due to action or regret due to inaction. So regret due to action would be, you know, I regret that I cheated on my wife and that led to my divorce. So because of an action that I committed, it led to a bad consequence and I regret that action. Regret due to inaction would be, I, you know, I regret that I never pursued my interest in, in art and art history and architecture and instead I became you know, a, uh, a pediatrician because my dad was a pediatrician and that's what was expected of me. So I regret that I never took that other road. Now it turns out, folks, as perhaps you might uh, I don't know if you, you would have thought so, 
But it turns out that over the long haul, the regret that looms the largest in people's minds is those of inaction, of the road not taken. So in the context of my book on happiness, which I, I so hope that you you get a copy. Uh, I mean, it's done reasonably well, but not nearly as well as was expected of it, in part because the publisher was bought out, was going through a complete chaos as my book had just come out. And so it, you know, it, it basically fell through the cracks. I'm hoping now that the paperback version is going to be released with the publisher who bought my old publisher. So hopefully it will find its appropriate attention. But I, I really hope that you you purchase a copy. It's a really fun book. It's a it's a it's a mix of you know ancient wisdoms. You know here come the ancient Greeks. Here comes Epictetus. Here comes Seneca. Here comes Aristotle. Here comes Aurelius and so on. Because of course they wrote a lot about uh, you know the good life and happiness. And it is backed up by contemporary science and positive psychology, happiness studies. Uh, you know, hedonic psychology, neuroscience, and then peppered with all of my personal stories, just like the one I just read to you about the, you know, Nobel Prize or money. And so I hope that you get it. But in any case, in the book, the chapter on regret, I talk about that, you know, one of the ways that you could forestall regret later in your life is to live an authentic life. Now, authentic doesn't just mean authentic in that you're a real person. You know, I am an authentic guy. I speak my mind. I don't, I'm not two-faced. I mean, that's true. You should be authentic. But it's, I mean it in a more broader, grander, existential authenticity. Be true to yourself. That's why the old Delphic maxim, right? Know thyself is so powerful, right? It's so powerful because it's so simple, but yet so profound. Know thyself. You're going to make mistakes in life if if you don't know who you are, right? But if you know that you're going to be happiest being an artist, then maybe you shouldn't become a pediatrician just because your dad said that's the right thing to do in the contemporary market. That's a sure way to wake up at 55 and say, I'm facing a midlife crisis. So anyway, so Daniel Kahneman is unbelievable because anyone who does any research in anything resembling decision making ends up citing him. It could be accountants. It could be engineers. It could be physicians. Right? So there's a whole field of medical decision-making, and they all cite their work. It could be political decision-making. It could be consumer decision-making, which is you know the area that I'm more in, or behavioral decision theory, which is the area that I'm in. So I just earlier, before, as I was preparing, when I, when I first announced that I was going to have a, a, uh, an X spaces on Danny Kahneman, I just went to check his um, Google Scholar bibliometrics. Now... I don't, I'm not sure if many of you understand what the metrics are, but like there are several key metrics when you look at the influence of a, of a, an academic. Number one, it could be just the number of papers that they've published. But if the number of papers that they've published are ultimately not cited, so you could have a person who's published 10 papers and those 10 papers have been cited 10,000 times. You could have another person who's been, who's published 50 papers, but they've only been cited 500 times. So even though the latter person has published five times more paper, the influence of his or her research is much lesser in that it hasn't been cited by others. So usually when you go to Google Scholar, you will check a few metrics, one of which is called the H-index, which is a way to take a snapshot of how good a researcher is. So an H-index of over 30 is typically what you would expect of, say, a, a, a full professor that's you know at a good university. Well, his H index is 158, I think. I mean, it is, and, and this is not a linear measure. So it, it is so astoundingly high. So that, like, let me give you another, without getting into the weeds of what the H index is, just total number of citations. I mean, if you are talking about, if you're a scholar that has, you know, a few thousand citations, you, you know, you're doing well. You know, some of the top psychologists might have 30,000, 20,000, 50,000. Daniel Kahneman's total citations in academia is 500,000 plus. So he's not even, it's kind of like saying that, you know, it's basically like, like Lionel Messi, right? The, the average top goal scorer will score 200 goals in their career if they are amazing. Wow, that's amazing. He's got, he scored 200 goals in his, in his professional career. Well, Lionel Messi is well over 800. 
right? So it's it's a it's a level of influence that's difficult to uh, to 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 you know to impart to people. Really, an important guy. Uh, now, let me just mention a few things. So I I was very much into uh, you know Kahneman and Tversky and I mean that's that that's exactly what my doctoral dissertation was all about. But then I became slightly disillusioned, and so let me explain. And and this is please don't. I mean I've been I've been only saying unbelievably positive things about Kahneman, and 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 nothing that I'm going to say now is going to take away from the fact that I think he's just one of the true, you know, behavioral science giants ever. So please don't take this as you know me critiquing him in any forceful way. But let me just explain why I started to slowly deviate away from some of this work. What ended up happening with the behavioral decision-making framework is what I and I think a few others began calling it the violation of the month club, meaning that every month some really bright psychologist would come up with yet another clever demonstration of how idiotic classical economists are. So basically the, the, the thing that was driving the research is Classical economists think that we are these hyper-rational creatures and our job as behavioral decision theorists is to demonstrate that they are wrong. Well, I got tired of that because to me it seems like if I spend my entire career as an anatomist proving to you that the pancreas of human beings is different from that of the unicorn, well, but the unicorn doesn't exist. So rather than worry about demonstrating that our pancreas don't work in the way that the unicorn, again, here the analogy is that homo economicus, the, the view of decision-making as espoused by classical economists, is the unicorn. It only exists in the recesses of, of their minds. And so I got we got it. Human beings don't behave according to what classical economists tell us how we should behave. What interested me more, and now hopefully maybe you're going to get to where I'm going with this, if you know my work, I'm an evolutionary scientist, right? Evolutionary psychologist. I was more interested in understanding why the architecture of the human mind is the way that it is. So if we do succumb to the framing effect, what is the evolutionary reason for us to have that, if you like, cognitive capacity to be uh, swayed in that way. So rather than simply demonstrating that we don't do that which the classical economists expect us to do, just let's study why the architecture of the human mind is the way that it is. And that's why I, that I kind of shifted away from psychology of decision making in the traditional sense to more of an evolutionary behavioral science approach. And so now I'm going to come to so how would I study uh, some of these cognitive biases that I discussed from an evolutionary perspective? So hopefully this will blow your mind. So remember when I mentioned the the framing effect? The you know if I sh if I tell you that a burger is ninety percent fat free, or tell you that it's ten percent fat, or if I tell you that three out of five dentists recommend this toothpaste is the same thing as telling you two out of five don't. Well, what Kahneman and Tversky did is demonstrated that the framing effect exists, that, that we don't, we are succumbing to this, this cognitive distortion. Okay, great, that, that's wonderful. What I wanted to do is say, is there a way that I can put the evolutionary lens to elucidate something a bit more, something deeper about the, the, that distortion, the, the framing effect? And so with one of my former uh, doctoral students, who himself is now a chaired professor, uh, his name is Tripat Gill, in 2014, we published a paper in Evolution and Human Behavior, which is the top um, you know, evolutionary journal, the behavioral sciences, where we studied the framing effect from an evolutionary perspective. Let me explain how we did that. By the way, people, you're getting all this at night for free. Imagine you're doing this in university. This course would have cost you $15,000. So do the right thing, 
go subscribe to my exclusive content. If, for example, if you want to have a Q and A period with me, well, then you go to subscription. And and by the way, I, you know, I do this. I, I love doing this for the mere fact of sharing ideas. And I've spent much of my career giving things for free. But it's also nice to monetize your time and expertise. So, as I mentioned yesterday, for the price of a latte, you can have you could be supporting me and if imagine if i get 10,000 20,000 people who are subscribing suddenly if i decide that it's too dangerous for me to go to university and i want to quit and just create content all day long for thousands of people i can do that so anyways think about it i hope that you'll subscribe so how did i study the framing effect from an evolutionary perspective well rather than talking about three out of five dentists recommend this toothpaste or two out of five don't. What if we look at an evolutionarily relevant problem or decision? So let's talk about mating. Suppose that I tell you, I think, I hope that this blows your mind. I know it will blow your mind. What if I told you, I want you to evaluate these prospective mates for you to go out with them? And I'm going to describe them to you in one of two ways. Maybe you see where I'm going with this. So let's take intelligence, which is an important mating attribute that both men and women care about. What if I told you that eight out of the 10 people that are acquaintances of this guy or this, this person think that he's intelligent? Well, that's exactly like saying two out of 10 don't, right? So for all of these mating attributes, I can either frame the description of the prospective suitor using a positive frame or a negative frame. You follow? I could either say 7 out of 10 think that she is very good looking or I could say 3 out of 10 think that she's not very good looking. Those two statements are identical. They're isomorphically equivalent. But here is the kicker. You ready? I won't tell you the, the full details of the study. We had a whole bunch of manipulations. We looked at short-term mating versus long-term mating. I'm just trying to give you the big story. Within the context of mate choice, who bears the greater costs for making a suboptimal mate choice? Well, it should be easy to answer. Of course, it's women. This comes from the theory called parental investment theory, which says that that sex in any species that has to provide the greater minimal obligatory parental investment is the sex that's going to be more sexually choosy for very obvious reasons. Because if, if they are the ones who bear the greater costs in making a poor choice, then they have to be judicious in their mate choice. This is why in every culture that's ever been studied, in every religion that has any prescriptions about how men and women should behave, it's not surprising that God seems to be a lot more concerned about the sexual behavior of women than he is of men. Apparently, God is an evolutionary psychologist. Okay? So, we take that principle and say, well, so applying the evolutionary lens that recognizes that there is a differential cost for men and women in making a poor choice in the mating market, we expect, we hypothesized, and that's exactly what we found, that when it comes to the framing effect, but specifically in the mating domain, women would be much more likely to succumb to the framing effect precisely because negatively framed information will loom much larger in their psyche. Do you follow what I'm saying? When I tell you it's 7 out of 10 think that he is intelligent, it's the same thing as telling you that 3 out of 10 don't think that he's intelligent. Well, men and women evaluate the positively framed information similarly, but women evaluate the negatively framed information much more harshly. So that cognitive distortion has a sex specificity to it because of an evolutionary reality. This is deep. Each one of you assholes owes me a thousand dollars for a, for for sharing with you this kind of depth and profundity. Now I'm gonna get someone, but it wasn't nice when you said the word asshole. I'm kidding. I'm just I'm just being gad. Okay. So let's summarize. 
Yes, the framing effect occurs, but in evolutionarily important domains, I can predict a sex difference in the proclivity of succumbing to the framing effect because of an evolutionary catalyst. So this is where, if you like, I added, if I can be bold enough to say that, I added to the work uh, of Daniel Kahneman because Daniel Kahneman was a lot more concerned about simply highlighting these cognitive biases. And I tried to come along, in this case with my brilliant former doctoral student, Tripad Gill, and say, oh yes, okay, there, there are these cognitive biases and there is an evolutionary logic for why these uh, biases exist in the form that they do. Okay, so that's that. I just wanted to maybe share one final uh, personal story that speaks to the extent to which uh, Kahneman and Tversky are brilliant. So my former doctoral supervisor, Jay Russo, who, by the way, only recently retired. He retired at, I think he was almost 81. I think he was either 80 or 81. And uh, uh, it was a really beautiful thing. Uh, some, some of his doctoral students organized a kind of retirement goodbye. So in uh, June 2022, uh, a bunch of his uh, former doctoral students went down to Ithaca, to Cornell, and, uh, you know, we had a, a wonderful time with him and, and to honor him and so on. And, and Jay remained incredibly productive to the, to the last minute. As a matter of fact, that, that, that he, he held like a seminar the last day with all of us. And you would think we're back to being, you know, 26-year-old doctoral students because you would think, okay, he's going to give a talk about, you know, lessons learned in my long illustrious career as a cognitive and mathematical psychologist and you know business school professor no he was in the weeds he was telling you what reviewer two said in the paper that he had just submitted to the journal I mean, he was just going full throttle a real a true scientist through and through uh, unbelievable guy i tell i discuss several several stories of my time at Cornell in the, the happiness book. But anyways, the reason why I'm mentioning him right now is because one day he told me, uh, we were sitting around, and you know, Jay is someone who, you know, is a very austere guy. He, he could be intimidating. You know, you don't mess around with Jay Russo. Uh, he was very, he was a fantastic mentor, but, you know, you you better know your stuff. You better not mess around. You better you better do the work. You better, you know, be creative. You better be hardworking. He expected the world of you. And I course I thank him for that for that mentorship so one day we were sitting and he says to me you know Gad it isn't very often that I'm the dumbest guy in a room uh, Jay knew that he was obviously a very bright guy now let me set up the the story of which room he was talking about so Jay had served on a doctoral committee of a, of an individual who subsequently himself became a very uh, accomplished professor and uh, decision theorist. And on that committee of that student, who's now a very senior professor, uh, the other committee members, so there was Jay, who, who in most rooms will be the smartest guy. Uh, the others were Herb Simon, who won the 1978 Nobel Prize, and Amos Tversky, the the gentleman who would have won the Nobel Prize with Daniel Kahneman had he not passed away in 1996. And so he, so, so Jay says to me, you know, Gad, it isn't very often that I am the dumbest guy in a room. But whenever we met in that room, you know, with the doctoral committee of that student, I was always the dumbest guy in that room, which is a less, I mean, I love the story because ultimately it's a, it's a, it demonstrates humility for him to say that, notwithstanding that it's probably true, even though obviously Jay is an incredibly bright professor. But it, it always reminded me of the fact that, you know, life is truly relative, right? So if you walk into a prison as a super tough guy and you think, I've got nothing to worry about in prison. I mean, people know what a damn tough guy I am. Guess what? There are guys in prison 
that are going to be tougher than you. I mean, short of you being Lionel Messi, right? Where, you know, you know by definition that you're the greatest soccer player ever. No matter how good you are in mathematics and how accomplished you are as a professor and how eloquent you are as an orator, there's always going to be some room where uh, you're going to eat humble pie, which actually is a, is a beautiful thing because it, it, it causes us to always want to aspire to be better and so on, right? I mean, Lionel Messi had won everything short of the World Cup and he didn't stop until he eventually did win the World Cup. So it is a beautiful thing to compare yourself to relevant others and to have the humility to say, yeah, I, I, may, be, I may be a great scholar, but guess what? There are these other folks that I'd like to emulate that are even crushing it 10 times more than I am. And I want to be hopefully as good as them. And, and that never stops, right? I mean, I could easily stop now and say, hey, I'm a, you know, I'm probably better known as a professor than 99.9 .9 professors, you know, anywhere. But I don't look at it that way. I, I look at my bibliometric score compared to Amos Tversky and I go, God damn, I got to find a way to be more productive. What the hell? I'm, I'm not 1% of what this guy's accomplished in terms of, in, in terms of, you know, academic bibliometrics. And so, uh, yeah, so that's called social comparison theory, right? Compare yourself to relevant others and hopefully that can uh, motivate you. So there you have it. Today was a certainly a sad day from the perspective of a unbelievable academic, Daniel Kahneman, passing, passing away. Uh, may he rest in peace. I know that he will certainly be immortal in the sense that his work will be undoubtedly cited for centuries to come. You know, you know, there are some researchers that ride a fad, right? They're, they're, you know, Michel Foucault, the bullshitter postmodernist was, you know, cited a lot when postmodernism, you know, was one of those mind viruses that was spreading, you know, what I call idea pathogens in the parasitic mind. I don't expect that Michel Foucault in 200 years is going to be a bleep on anybody's radar. But uh, the work of Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman will, because there's no way that anyone who wants to study psychology of decision-making uh, can ever avoid seeing their work. And so he is immortal. He may physically be gone, but uh, his mimetic immortality is guaranteed. So there you have it, folks. I hope that you enjoyed this, uh, wow, almost 50-minute lecture on Danny Kahneman, psychology of decision-making. I'm heading out to spend some time with the family. Uh, as I said, if you wish to interact with me, the best way to do so is by uh, subscribing. What, I, what I'll try to do, and that's what I've been doing the last few times I've done X Spaces, uh, except yesterday I didn't do that, is once I finish the general X Spaces, then I go into a subscriber-only X Spaces where I actually do take the questions of people. And we, we end up having these incredible conversations because, as you might expect, you know, the people who typically subscribe to the, my stuff you know, tend to, you know, be very intellectually curious. Oftentimes, they're other academics or they're graduate students or, and so we really end up having these incredible organic conversations. So thank you so much for your attention. Uh, I will probably, I mean, this will stay up as a recorded uh, X spaces, but I will probably take it and uh, upload it on my uh, YouTube channel and my podcast. And please, if you haven't done so, please consider this is free, so I'm not pleading for any of your latte money. Uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel and or uh, my podcast. Thank you so much, guys. Have a great evening, and I'll see you soon. Cheers, everybody.